Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Samantha Brewer. I'm the Volunteer Engagement Coordinator for the USA National Phenology Network. Um, I'm joined here by Amanda Wanless from uh, Indiana Phenology and Kevin and Beth Mayer from uh, the Tree Spotters. And what we're going to talk about today is um, we just want an opportunity for some of our local phenology leaders and previous um, pheno champions. And I believe Sarah is here too um, from Laura from, ah, oh my gosh, my poor brain. Um, but Sarah's here as well, if you wanna pipe in and talk about your program too. Um, but we just kind of wanna introduce you guys to some of our local phonology leaders, talk a little bit about how you can get involved with local phonology programs and just have a chance to get to know each other a little bit and how you can get involved in um, documenting seasons, seasonal changes in plants and animals um, where you are. So I will go ahead and I will this over to Amanda. Um, and yeah, let us know who you are and tell us about your program. Thank you. Um, so I'm Amanda Wanless and I am with Indiana Phenology. Um, we are based in Indianapolis or, or thereabouts. And um, uh, I thought I would uh, tell you a little bit of my story and how we got our um, local phenology programs started because it really is, is is my story. So um, I grew up out west. I grew up in Utah. Uh, it's very dry and deserty there. Um, and when I was in my mid-20s, I decided to uh, come out to Indiana to do a master's program in environmental science and public affairs. And I had always been a plant person. I'd always you know, knew what was happening and when in my environment when I grew up, but then I moved out west and it's totally different here. If you've never visited the Midwest, it's nice and lush and green. There's lots of water everywhere. It rains. It didn't do that a whole lot where I grew up. And um, so I was really curious when I, I moved out here, how things were going to be different. We had some of the same plants, but uh, I was sure that things were going to be different. They just had to be with, with the climate being a, a, as, um, as different as it was. And so I moved here. I went, did a lot of research. I'm like, when do things bloom? I've got to know. I've got to know. And I just did not find anything specific. I found things like it blooms sometime between April 1st and May 15th, which was not helpful to me. Um, it didn't give me that, that connection that I, I was looking for. And so I started to take records. I started to write notes um, when I saw things happening as, as I was going through my graduate program. And as I'm sure you can imagine, um, when you are in school, you're busy. Um, so it was not at the top of my list of things to do, and I did not keep a complete record. I do really great at the very beginning of spring, like right about how we are right now, um, where uh, I am ready for every little itsy bitsy teeny uh, bit of green that might show up. And um, I, I'm looking at those dormant buds and I'm like, are they open yet? Are they green? Are they not? Are they swelling? And, and everything is super exciting. But then spring starts to get rolling and everything is doing its thing. And I was not so great at keeping records then. Um, I keep them on scraps of paper, stuff them in my bag. I'd lose them by the end of the season. I'd be like, I thought I should type these up so I can search them. And um, I'm, you get the picture. I could go on. But uh, Fast forward a couple of years, um, I tried to keep track of it. I was interested. I learned more about where I was. And then a chance Facebook post uh, crossed my feed from a friend. And it was um, the status of spring map, uh, which you should go check that out. If you have not looked at it recently, spring has arrived to where I am according to that map. But it was uh, the status of spring map showing when spring arrives across the country, uh, USA National Phenology Network's awesome thing here. And so I saw the map, I was super intrigued. I immediately went uh, to dig up everything I could about the map, how it was created, where it came from, which of course took me to the website and then uh, from there, several hours later, um, well into early hours of the morning, um, I, I was totally hooked. I had signed up for Nature's Notebook. I had found my way to the local phenology um, leader certification waiting list and signed up there. And um, really, it was one of those things where it kind of changed the trajectory of my life. And I have 
since in the last, oh, that, that was about 2017 that I, I found my way to Nature's Notebook. And um, 20, I, I don't remember, maybe it was 2018 um, is when we started our first local phenology program. And uh, I really made studying phenology the kind of focus of my professional career. And to tell you a little bit about Indiana Phenology, I started um, the organization. It's a nonprofit. Um, our mission is to engage Hoosiers, people of Indiana, of all ages in phenology data collection. Um, we want to do this to increase environmental awareness and knowledge and connection to where we live, but also to support science-based environmental policy. And um, so that's, that's our mission. Uh, what we do is we have three parallel programs that, that engage different audiences. So we have our Backyard Observers Program that engages individuals and families in documenting phenology on their private land or on nearby nature areas. Um, we have our Phenology Trail Program that we work with um, partner sites that have some sort of land to engage their audience in documenting um, phenology and to support their education or management or research goals. And then we also work with schools and we work with teachers to support them, give the tool, them the tools and training they need so that they can get their students um, using Nature's Notebook and documenting uh, phenology at school. And um, over the course of uh, the last five years that we've been an official nonprofit, six or seven that I've been collecting phenology data. Um, in Indiana, there are now 334,498 phenology status records. So those are uh, those yes or no's. Each one of those counts as, as its own record. And um, about 2,500 or two, 200 totally, I'm tongue tied here. Let me read that number again. 254,604 of those records are our organizations. Um, in, in some way, we, we were responsible for getting those started. So um, that's a, a quarter of a million records, which is amazing that there's now actual dates and things that I can go back and look at. And, and um, we're starting to develop those records that I was looking for back when I moved here and I couldn't find. Um, our ultimate goal is to have this super awesome, uh, still kind of in my imagination right now, website where people can go and they can interact with our data. Um, they can ask questions and get those answers like when are maples flowering here? When did they flower last year? Can I see that actual day and not just that four to six week range? Um, so I, I, I could talk for um, hours and hours on our <laughs> phenology program. Um, but I, um, you know, maybe I'll uh, stop it right there. And, uh, you know, I think that gives you the overview. Um, we've got about 13 sites on our phenology trail program. We've got about four schools this year that are participating. We're in about 30 counties. Um, we have anywhere from uh, 30 to 75 active observers in any given month that vacillates because people have lives, but um, awesome, lots of fun. And I'm excited to hear about some of the other programs too. Yay, thank you, Amanda. I, your guys' program is amazing and all the different um, schools and organizations that you work with. And just, I love your story about just you wanted to get into figuring out when these plants are blooming and now you're helping other people being able to find those too. And I just think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'll put some links in the chat too for Indiana Phenology um, and um, for their Instagram and their um, homepage um, if you guys wanna learn more. And I'll pass it on now um, to Kevin and Beth uh, Mehar who, um, who uh, are who are the leaders for the tree spotters, and they've got a wonderful story too. Well, and I also want to just shout out to Anne too. So Anne, please jump in. She's one of the tree spotters. Also, I will say that we're um, the second wave of a program that really started. I mean, Amanda, it's just wonderful to hear your enthusiasm and everything that you had going. We're actually sort of phase two of a program that was started 
at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston, Massachusetts. And the Arboretum is part of Harvard University. And a researcher there, Lizzie Volkovich, started the program in 2015. And, you know, correct me with any dates here, but she and her grad students wanted to look at, you know, particular information and at the Arboretum with all the temperate and woody plants. Kevin, maybe you can speak to how big the Arboretum is, but it's- About 300 acres. But they have 15,000 accession trees in their database. Yeah, so that means they're all labeled and- They know their provenance. Yeah. Yeah. And so she wanted to look particularly at native plants to the area, which included maples and oaks and um, you know, beaches and other things like that. And then th later we actually added some shrubs to that too. But for, f I would say, five years, um, it was extremely uh, strong program. Kevin and I were one of the in one of the first classes, and Ann, I, were you there pretty early on too? Yeah, I was there in two thousand and fifteen, in the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, it was very exciting. I mean, they really thought. I mean, I thought tree spotters was just that's the name of what we do until I talked with someone and said, oh, no, no, we were really brainstorming to come up with this. And we're still not sure if that's the right name. But um, it was a, a, a combination of researchers led and also a very um, active volunteer group headed by Suze Morozak, who wasn't able to join us today. But really did quite a bit as far as getting training sessions set up and advertising for them. And the Arboretum also provides a number of um, programs too, something they call a tree mob where you all meet at a tree and they talk about it and things like that. And there are classes indoors and out. And we went from training the Arboretum even, so we have, we I think there are 75 trees and shrubs altogether. Sadly, some of them have died and this is over 15 species. And they even put these beautiful plaques on the trees so we're able to find them easily. And we would go around in groups or individually. Um, so, and this happened for five years. Lizzie got offered a tenure track pre professorship on the other side of the country in British Columbia. So, but she still had grad students who, you know, were interested in the data and still at Harvard. So the program continued um, for, well, I'm not sure exactly when she left, but I know, you know, Harvard told us their support of it was going to end in 2020, which coincided with the pandemic. Um, but I think at one point they had trained over 400 volunteers mm -hmm. and there would be um, refresher courses for everyone. And in addition, Sue's put out this, I don't know if, Anne, if you remember if it was monthly or quarterly. Uh, it, a it, newsletter. I think it was monthly. It was yeah. monthly that, that newsletter. Yeah, Amazing. called Spot On. And we would have different gatherings from, you know, potlucks and we would do book discussions and, and things like that too. And I think when, um, you know, when Harvard said they were gonna end it, the question was, you know, some of us really thought, well, we've been collecting all this data and it would be nice to continue to collect the data. It would have been great if Harvard was still supporting it, but we, you know, we sort of rallied around to see who, you know, wanted to stay on. And of the over 400, I guess it would be about 10%, about 45 people said that they wanted to be on a Google Groups email. So, you know, we would stay in touch with each other. Certainly the first year, I think, during the pandemic, I don't think Harvard even wanted groups of people to meet on their property together. So, we would do a number of things on Zoom and then go out individually and do things. Um, but um, so it's been interesting because it's become, you know, sort of a more, 
personalized group. We've gotten to know each other a lot better. I'd say there are about 10 to 12 of us who are especially active. One person chose to just do the trees around her uh, where she lives. So, but she still participates in some of our other activities. So we've been, you know, back and forth talking with Harvard about how it might work for them to take us under wing again, because we are, unlike Amanda, we are amateur at best scientists and sort of always kind of question the readings we do. Anne has created some wonderful things from the things she's collected of the trees she spotted from, <laughs> I think it was hickory nut cookies or something. Or some yeah, cookies. I've done a lot. Done my my you didn't no um yeah I've made a bunch of stuff from the nuts and yeah 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 so um but yeah so th that's where we are and it was it's it's just invigorating to hear what's going on I feel like we're in sort of a sustaining maintenance phase because we didn't feel that we had the expertise to be training people though. So, we're still listed in the volunteers under the Arboretum website in sort of their past things they do, but there's a way to link to us. So in fact, there's a young woman um, who's uh, in central Massachusetts who just joined us for a couple of visits because she's in uh, studying ecology and is taking a look at some of the trees that we've been looking at. Um, we're also, Lizzie did say that, you know, she'd be happy to put um, our information on her web page. So I don't know if, if you have that, Samantha, but it does have, I was just looking through it recently, these wonderful training slides that I thought, oh, yes, I should study those again as far as, you know, what we're looking at and how we should go about looking at them. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I think you've hit the, the nail on the head. What what really kicked the program off was Harvard's involvement, allowing their profess well, Lizzie and others, graduate students, to give us some really good training. And once that shut down, we didn't really add very many new tree spotters, and we could use somebody mm -hmm. to, to replace Lizzie. But it just didn't work out at Harvard. I mean, we we didn't forget everything, but we aren't, aren't good teachers, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Lizzie comes back to the area about once a year, and she always makes a point, and we have some fun tour with her. And you know, I think she would like to support us as much as she can, but it's three thousand miles away, and so um, so that's our our status at this point. There we go. I lost. I lost my um, my little arrow there. Thank you guys. I I wanted to mention too that um your program won the Fino Champion Awards. It was right when I started here, and so like Aaron was showing me. Okay, here's like how we um look at the applications, and I just remember being so touched by your program because you had overcome such a huge challenge of not having that support anymore, but all your volunteers were so dedicated. You guys still had that group and you were still collecting data and you were still had so much heart into that program. And I love that you're still doing it and still bringing volunteers. And I think it's wonderful. You were tell, you told us about like the Facebook groups you had set up. I don't know if this was the website that you were mentioning, but this is the one yes. um, yeah, that you. I have. Yeah. So if anyone wants to learn more about the tree spotters, um, there's the website with the information about it, but it was just such a cool story of how um, how you came to be and how you guys just loved loved what you did so much and kept doing it. And I just thought it was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then, and so also I forgot to mention, but um, uh, Indiana Phenology was one of our Pheno champion winners every year. Um, we do these surveys for our local phenology leaders and they can apply for the Pheno champion award. Um, we ask for like some testimonials from their volunteers. We look at their program outreach. We look at like some of their engagement in their communities. Um, and so we award a new uh, Pheno champion award every year. Um, and so Indiana Phenology has won before. So of the tree spotters and this year, um, Sarah Boys is here, and I am going to put you on the spot just a little bit um, from the Linda Loring Nature Foundation because there are winners for this year. 
Um, so go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. And I know like, I'm just like, hey, Sarah, do you want to talk? But really just, just brag about your program a little bit. Tell us about your program. Tell us about your volunteers. How'd you guys get started? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I wasn't trying to like take over the, <laughs> the today's. I just wanted to hear from what other people do. I'm always interested in hearing how other people organize their programs and work with volunteers. And I also want like Anne and Beth and Kevin, I want to adopt you all to come to our program <laughs> um, as like dedicated, those like the most dedicated volunteers. And I think a lot of our talk talks and discussion is about how do you not only engage volunteers, but keep volunteers over the long term. And I just want to say like kudos to you guys for being so dedicated. Um, so I'm at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, which is a small land trust on Nantucket Island off Massachusetts. Um, and we have 275 acres, which isn't a ton, but for the size of the island, it's it's a pretty nice acreage. Um, I guess I came to our phenology program a little, I want to say backwards, maybe it's a little bit similar to Lizzie, and um, is that, so I'm a plant ecologist by training, and when I started my job here at Linda Loring, um, I was the first researcher and ecologist in my position. And one of the things that I've always really felt strongly about is the wonderful opportunity of a land trust is to have these long-term projects, you know, similar to like the Aldo Leopold Center where you can collect long-term data. It's not the life of um, a grad student or, you know, it's not these like short five-year cycles or grant cycles. And so I, you know, pitched the idea of putting together a phenology program that would benefit us by collecting you know, data, we could kind of look at some short term data, but then we could build this long term program. So that's kind of like was my initial goal. And so early on, our goal was, you know, to collect, um, we collect phenology data on our property on eight different species of native shrubs, which are um, uh, kind of dominant native shrubs on the landscape that really shape our plant communities here on Nantucket. So basically, like I kept thinking like, well, if something changes with the phenology and with any of these species, it's going to really have dramatic changes on the landscape. That's kind of what the what the motivation was um, and why I chose the species. And so um, first of all, National Phenology Network made it really easy and wonderful to add species. So I kept thinking, oh, that, you know, early on and when I first started in uh, 2014, 2015, thinking about what species I wanted to do, I was like, oh, I'm so limited. But then because of our you know, limited niche of, um, of species, but we just proposed new species and they got accepted, which I thought was really wonderful. Um, and so then it became you know personal to our location, which is great. And then we have some species like a black cherry that are um, you know more widely um, looked at, which is great for comparisons, right? Um, and so, I started with really just having our interns and our volunteers to our organization. And so kind of more limited, I didn't start as like a big volunteer program and it has sort of grown more naturally um, over the last um, 10 years or so like almost 10 years. And so now I have like the same school groups that um, like come through and actually we're doing a big field trip on Monday um, where they see our tagged plants and you know, we have we do some phenology at their school, but they come to the land trust and kind of learn about what we do and why and some of our preliminary pre preliminary findings. And, um, you know, we have gone through a recent strategic plan and strategic planning of our organization. And one of the things that we decided was um, with the climate change um, uh, impacts that we're seeing on the island that our education and outreach like phenology is going to be one of the big like main focuses of our organization, um, which is, so that's sort of new. So we're in this kind of growth phase of our phenology program. So not only are we maintaining our long-term data that we've been collecting um, with other aspects of our organization, we're adding like um, a bird, a migratory bird banding program and like putting it, thinking about like the phenological implications of that. We're, so we're adding research projects that kind of fit into the phenology portfolio. But what I'm really excited about in terms of getting the Fino Champion Award is that we're also really starting, but actually, sorry, I'm like kind of all over the place because I wasn't thinking of um, speaking, but the the Friday calls, the, the, the phen phenology leader calls, I can't always make it in person, but I, I listen to a lot of them or watch them later. And I've been learning from others about the best ways to kind of 
showcase the data and what you're doing. And Amanda, I'm super interested to go to the, your website to see some of the ways that you um, interpret and do your outreach um, because people absorb the information different ways, right? And so um, we got a small grant from one of our local garden club to do um, some uh, highlight some additional species. So even though my research and the research that, you know, the data that we're collecting is on common native shrubs, um, everyone loves milkweeds, right? And we have tons of milkweeds in our front area, like very easily accessible. So we're starting to add um, some phen phenological data collection on our three milkweed species that are just in the front of our office. Um, we're kind of showcasing some additional plants like our black cherries, which our research plants are kind of further on the property, kind of they're spread out in different microsites and they're some of them are hard to get to. So we chose some that are like right by the parking lot so that you can be like, here's what we're talking about. Here's these great plants. Um, and so I'm kind of putting on different hats, like the researcher hat. And then I put on the like pheno champion hat is what we're going to say now <laughs> that to say, you know, um, to the like, different ways of showcasing the work and, and what people are, are looking at. Um, we also had, we started collecting data too on Eastern tent caterpillars because we had some students that were working with us that just became totally obsessed with them. And now I'm obsessed with them and they're such a great phenological indicator. And so um, I've just learned from our volunteers and students, um, you know, just as I'm hoping they learn from us. So it's been a real, um, you know, learning curve for me too over time, but um, I'm really thankful to you for the um, MPN's uh, support and continued information. And I hope with programs like Tree Spotters, if you don't have your like leader that started the program, you guys are doing a fantastic job, but also with the support of NPN and the materials and like just all the information available for the different species, I think um, has been hugely helpful. So thank you so much, Samantha, for all your work too. Oh, thank you. And I'm really loving the kind of common theme with all of you where you kind of started small and look how much it's grown and changed through the years. And that's just so cool. So no, thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for sharing too. And then I almost forgot Sarah, Cam I can't believe I'm so sorry, but Sarah Cameron is also here from Oregon Seams and Trackers. Um, who's another, I believe you guys won Fino Champion one year um, as well. Um, but you're newer um, to the group. Um, but yeah, please, um, Sarah, go ahead. Tell us a little bit about your program. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so my name is Sarah Cameron, and I coordinate the Oregon Season Tracker Program. Uh, we're affiliated with Oregon State University Extension. Um, the program was started back in 2014, but I got involved just in this last year. Um, I'm Originally from Wisconsin, I found my way out to Oregon a couple of years back, and back in Wisconsin, I did a couple jobs involving citizen community science. Um, when I came out here and I saw that OSU Extension had Oregon Season Tracker Community Science Program, I was like, hey, does anyone want help with that? And they were like, yes, we're all retiring. Here, take it. Um, so it got handed off to me. Last year, um, it unfortunately is a smaller part of my position, but I'm always trying to carve out ways to get more involved. So um, I'm actually right now going through the um, LPN or local phonology leader. Yes, um, the program with Samantha, um, really looking forward to kind of learning more through that. Um, but also, yeah, learned a lot through it was Jody, Brad, um, Glenn is still around. So those were the folks who kind of helped start um, season tracker back in 2014. And so our project is a little interesting. It's a two-pronged approach to climate research. So we have folks that are using the uh, Nature's Notebook platform to monitor native plants um, across the state here in Oregon. We have about a dozen species, but our focal species is the vine maple. Um, so that's kind of one piece of season tracker. And then we also have folks that are using the Coco Raz platform, um, which is the collaborative community rain, hail, and snow network. So rain gauges, monitoring, uh, precipitation. So kind of two pieces of the puzzle. We have a lot of volunteers that do both. Uh, we have some volunteers that just do one or the other. So it's kind of a um, 
mishmash of volunteers across the state here in Oregon. Um, and the reason we do have kind of those two pieces of the season tracker puzzle is um, we have one of our research partners affiliated with Oregon State University is the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest. They're a big research forest kind of smack dab um, in the Willamette National Forest. And so they do a lot of research on vine maple down there. And so that was one of the big incentives for getting Oregon Season Tracker going is this idea that, you know, we're learning a lot about vine maple here on this property, but is what we're learning kind of true across the rest of the state. And so Season Tracker just kind of built and built from there. Um, and then for the precipitation piece, kind of similar thread of we have researchers at Oregon State University who are doing a lot of um, climate modeling. And so just trying to help get them as much data as we can while getting folks here in Oregon um, involved in the program too. And so we piggyback on a lot of other Oregon State University programs, particularly here in Extension. So um, there's the Master Naturalist program, Master Gardeners. We have a lot of really well-established groups of volunteers that we kind of tap into to help rope into the Oregon Season Tracker program as well. Um, and this has been really fun hearing about the other programs involved in using Nature's Notebook too. I'm like over here, like typing in and making notes. Um, for example, really would love to connect more with schools. We have some schools involved and so, Indiana Phenology, it sounds like you're doing a lot of great work um, with Tree Spotters, kind of the volunteer community. Um, and then Sarah with the Pheno Champions, just as you were mentioning, kind of more like phenology trails and tagging plants. And so my role with Season Tracker is more kind of on the back end, training, coordinating volunteers. I miss being out in the field. So we're trying to kind of bring some of the volunteer tasks also into our program. Um, so kind of being hands off and hands on at the same time. But yeah, that that is my little spiel about Season Tracker. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. And yes, I'm happy having you in the course. And especially, yeah, part of the course too is funny is um, we do teach um, the local phonology leaders like how to get set up so that if you're moving on to something else, the next person is able to, <laughs> to take on that role. Um, because it's funny, you you kind of get start these programs and you love them so much and then, you know, life happens. Um, but being able to make sure that um, the program is able to live on, because whenever you have transitions, it's really difficult. So I'm really glad that you're here with Oregon Season Trackers um, and being able to coordinate with them. That's wonderful. Um, so and I'll put your Oregon Season Trackers um, web page up on here, too, so that people can learn more about that program. Um, but right now, what we really wanted to do is kind of open it up to um, a Q&A where actually it sounds like you guys might have questions for each other. <laughs> like, it's OK if I don't talk very much in this. Um, so, yeah, I am. I will say we have a small group and it's, you know, you're all very polite groups. So, um, I say go ahead and if you have a question, you can like slightly raise your hand or not, but go ahead and unmute yourselves. Um, and, and, you know, I did that awkwardly. <laughs> I guess I will start with this. Um, for all four of you groups, um, what has been, um, what has been um, the the most rewarding experience that you've had working with the volunteers, right? So all of you have, are local phonology leaders and one experience or another, right? Um, but what have you enjoyed most about working with your volunteers? Because a lot of you guys just started doing your own thing and now you're training others and now you're bringing other people in. And so um, I'll let you unmute yourselves for whoever wants to answer that first, but go ahead. but I can Let's also go ahead and answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, our original, our first trail site was um, at a park called Holiday Park. And um, that's the one that I'm most personally connected to. That's where I go and make my observations since we're trying to have a, a statewide um, program, but that one's located close to me. And I love going and training new volunteers. I love 
walking around and talking about the trees with them. And I love it when my volunteers send me pictures and ask questions. They're like, uh, what is this? <laughs> um, so one of my volunteers just sent me an, an email yesterday and he's like, yeah, I, I, this is how I answered the questions. Um, here's the picture of what I said was uh, breaking leaf buds, but I'm not sure if it's a leaf bud or a flower bud. And I just love getting into the nitty gritty and talking about that. And I love how the more that you look closely at things, the more that you realize you don't know everything and that's okay because it's exciting and adventurous and, and really fun to learn new things together. I have one that jumped out when you asked that question, Samantha, was um, when I, early on um, with our phenology program, we had, um, a, we had a junior rangers program. They're like middle school age kids. Um, and we had a very young junior ranger. She wasn't even in middle school yet, but her parents convinced me to let her join in. And she was interested in the phenology project. And so she was one of our volunteers who did other things too, but like she gravitated to the phenology project and she volunteered for a number of years, like every season with us. And then kind of, you know, as she was a teenager, she decided to get a job and not work with us. And then last year she came back and asked if she could volunteer in her senior year of high school because she um, was thinking about going to school for environmental science. And then I wrote her a recommendation letter and she just got accepted to UMass Amherst. And it was just like her, she saying her experience like in those early years and now she wants to work with plants. And I know not every volunteer, especially with kids, you're not like wanting everyone to necessarily have a career in the sciences. Um, we were, we're educating like a, scientifically literate community that's to me like the, the big picture goal but it's really meaningful to me when you know not just like I love teaching the word phonology to kids we're like they can learn any vocab it doesn't it's not difficult you know and so I love that but I think some of those individual pieces that are the like the threads I hold on to um, also one of the schools I work with very regularly I, I work with their seventh grade every single year um and they write the best thank you notes. And I think I included a picture of the thank you notes in our Vino you know, Champion application because it shows they write a thank you note for the field trip, but they drew pictures of like what I talked about. And they drew pictures of like a normalized curve of like flowering of a low bush blueberry plant. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's math and graphical and you've illustrated it. And so I just... um spreading phonology joy I guess, is, is really exciting when when kids are excited about that that kind of thing so just to say on the other end as far as being volunteers it, it really was all those things and I really felt and Anne you can speak to this too Kevin that it would be a way of making me see things more to really look closely and I, I just, you know, hearing, you know, the Sarah's and Amanda talk, I'm thinking, oh, if we just, you know, had somebody there just to say, yeah, you know, is it a flower bud? Is it a leaf bud? This is what we can look at. You know, we have to know what the cycle is, you know, just all those things. It's, you know, it's, and I will say that the volunteers and researchers that would go out in the field regularly and they would answer any question via email and, it, it it really was just a very, very um, fun conversation. And I will say, in hindsight, I wish I had gone into botany myself. So I think it's wonderful that it's promoting that at that end. But it's it's still very exciting. And we can keep learning, too. So I'll add in here too. So as mentioned, I'm a little more um, kind of fresh to coordinating our program, um, but kind of from the volunteer perspective, I will say it has given me a lot of my background has been birds and wildlife. And so um, transitioning into Oregon season tracker has been uh, a bit of a learning curve with the plants. Um, and as Beth said, I was like, it is helpful to have and it's nice we have a couple volunteers who are like native plant wizards and so I will go to them sometimes with questions too but I think it really is just it's made me have a lot 
deeper appreciation for even just the springtime um we have the cherry blossoms are blooming in Portland and I am just like a new level of like excitement with them. Um, but one thing I'll note for Oregon season tracker that I know was really special for connecting with volunteers. This was before my time. So I just get to be jealous of it. Um, but they had a really big volunteer um, gathering out at the HJ Andrews forest that I mentioned before, one of our research partners. And so they had about, I think 30 volunteers, they got a small grant, they brought folks out on buses, and they just had like three days in the woods of like learning from local researchers. And just, it's hard sometimes with some of these statewide programs. I mean, you get to know some folks over Zoom, but actually being able to, I think, connect in person is so special. And so um, I've heard so much about just those like three days from so many volunteers and from the staff members. And I just, yeah aspire to have something similar to that again one day. I want to sign up for that plant camp. It sounds like <laughs> that sounds really fun. Um, I can really relate to that plant thing. I also studied birds when I was in school and plants were like the things that birds lived on. So I took a couple of botany classes. Um, and even when I started with nature's notebook. I didn't even know what the word phonology was way back in the day when I started my own program. Um, and then when I actually had to look at plants every week and get to know the plants, I was like, oh, they do have little personalities. <laughs> and they do have like, so when you're looking at the plants and, and that's what I really love too about like training docents and training the volunteers is then you get to show people those little neat personalities that each one of your little plants had like little plants like you know major trees that have been along. but it's fun and, and I enjoy that and I, I relate to all those things. When I first started uh, to participate I really knew nothing I mean I live in the city I could I could tell uh, that it was a tree and in winter I didn't know if it was dead or alive and and this the having the Arnold Arboretum in our neighborhood has been like a tr a real treasure. And I've always been a very visual person, but I never paid attention so much. And it was like the perfect thing for me. I just really loved um, learning everything I could, and making all the mistakes and finding out about this um, when you enter the data finding out that if you did make a mistake, like you put the wrong thing, that because there were so many other people following that same thing, the researchers could figure out it was an abnormality. And I didn't stress so much about that. But eventually I got better at it. And I and I don't need to be in the Arnold Arboretum to recognize different species of trees. And that's been like amazing for someone like me who basically couldn't tell if one was dead or alive. I knew it was a tree. I didn't know they had different kinds. You know, I didn't know any of that stuff. So I've really loved it for that. I love that. And Anne, you did newsletters too for your group? I didn't do the newsletter. Oh, okay. um, I read them. <laughs> oh, you read them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. Um, so then my next question, I guess, for you all would be, um, what is the phenophase that your volunteers get most excited about when they see the first one of the year? So like, what's the one thing, right? They're going out and they're saying like, no, there's, you know, the trees, are they dead? Are they dormant? Right. But what's, um, it could be, you know, it could be caterpillars, it could be ripe fruits, but what's, is there anyone that like sticks out to you that everyone gets excited about? Well, I'm just going to speak for Anne. Anne, didn't you and Suze try to see when the buckeye was going to, the leaf out, was that by hours, I think. I think you're muted, Anne. It was the hickory. Um, we both were spotting the same tree and Sue had been there in the morning, Suze had been there in the morning and recorded that there was no bud burst. 
And I was there in the afternoon and it was a very clear bud burst and I had a picture of it. And I remember we, I put it on the Facebook group to, as proof. And it was, and she had seen that there, it had not happened, but within a few hours, we like really narrowed down that it just happened. That was pretty cool. We get excited about the Eastern tent caterpillar hatch and I, um, don't know if it's because I get like stupidly excited about it and that I'm enthusiastic that it's, a, it's kind of infectious that way, but because, um, you know, I'm totally as a plant ecologist, when I like other things get me really excited, like I'm a little kid. Cause I'm always, you know, we're always learning. And so I'm like, all these questions come up like, well, are, you know, is it, you know, with our trees and our shrubs, we're seeing like microsite variation across the property that, you know, these, you know, these shaded areas that are kind of protected are, you know, are, or that are um, exposed to the winds, you know, they'll bud out a little bit later than the like really open and exposed areas that are sunny, but on the, you know, south facing. Um, but like the caterpillars tend to kind of, you know, hatch out at the same day across our whole property. So we're kind of, I'm always really excited about that. And of course, anything that's the the first to happen. But I think in terms of without my influence, I think the um, fruit, the like the initial fruits of our low bush blueberries, because it's like means that summer is here. Um, everyone gets excited about blueberries and our low bush blueberries are one of our, our study species. Um, but then there's the frustration as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're like, oh, blueberries, blueberries, blueberries. And then right before it's actually ripe, of course, it disappears completely. Um, and I have to tell everyone every year, okay, volunteers, like you cannot eat the research plants. Like you eat any, any other blueberries are fair game. Like these blueberries over here are fine, but like, please don't pick the research plants. <laughs> The birds, yes, they they go for them, um, but that's yeah. Any 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 food plant gets very exciting. I'll say so. Um, here in Oregon, um, the winters are a little rough because we just get lots of rain and lots of gray, and we're very fortunate to have lots of beautiful conifers. But um, even in this last week, I've had a few volunteers who we've been corresponding for, you know, kind of questions, general other things, and I get a like, P.S. bud burst. Uh, and so I think that that feels a little extra special this time of year after um, the grays. And so I think that's just one that I've noticed. I enjoy it a lot, but that seems to get folks really excited for, you know, kind of thinking about spring and uh, what's to come in the year too. Just to add that at the Arnold Arboretum, original, the original plan was grouping trees together so researchers could compare them. And you know, it always seems like our trees are the last ones to do things, but it means that we, you know, can see other things happening around. So it's it has been fun. And as Anne said, I mean, we're fortunate that where we live in Boston, there are a number of trees and just to be walking around and say, oh, that's a blah, 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 and just to recognize them too. So that's that's been fun. So at our uh, holiday park site, there are two phenophases that it's 50 50 whether or not I'm going to get them and see them. Um, so one of them is the service berries ripe fruit. Um, because once those fruits are ripe, the birds, the squirrels, everything eats them off the bush. So they will be clearly not ripe one week and I will come back the following week and there is zero fruit anywhere on that tree. So that's one that uh, I, I think I've I've gotten it once when I can say yes to that one. Um, so I, I'm I'm on a mission to get that one one of these years. And then the other one is our, our red buds. So they um, are beautiful uh, maroon or magenta. Actually, there's the the word flowers that come out in the spring. But the um, breaking leaf buds. Um, once those uh, leaf buds pop open there's a leaf and they're just on their way. So there's it, usually it's no breaking leaf buds, 
and then leaves. There's there's no no yes to the breaking leaf buds because um, I, I mean it's it's got to be a matter of an hour or so when it first pops out before it, for that leaf is fully unfolded. And so that's that's one that um, I, I'm going to try and get to. And so uh, that's kind of exciting for our volunteers to hunt for that one and be the, the lucky winner to say yes. I love that you have elusive goal pheno phases. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think that's lovely. And my question is, is that I guess you can't really say fruit or seed drop, or can you? If they disappear, if there should be another category for that, I think, too. We say yes to a uh, recent fruit or seed drop because clearly it was there last week and it's not this week. So <laughs> it went somewhere. So we say, we say yes to that one for sure. And I think that's right too, because yeah, it's like there were, there were fruits and seeds last week and there aren't this week, but you don't have to keep saying yes, you know, after that one. Mm -hmm. The red buds too are such a cool one. That was a plant that I didn't know when I would ever get to see one in and it turned out on our, our campus arboretum had a couple because I was walking through and I was like, oh, that's a red bud. Like those flowers are just amazing and, and nothing like them. Um, I guess we're kind of close to the end of time. Thank you all so much for sharing. <laughs> That's really what I was hoping, just to hear some of your stories and the wonderful things that you do. Um, I love the local phenology programs we have all across the country. Um, the way you guys engage with your volunteers and bring people back week after week after week to like, you know, in the winter, they might be looking at sticks, but um, eventually, you know, those sticks do get more exciting. Um, and so I do want to share really quick. Um, I'm going to share my screen for anyone else who may be watching this. Um, but if you want to get um, involved in, um, oh, did that show the one? Did that show the right one? Is it showing the map? It should be showing the map. Okay, good. I've got a couple screens going on. Um, yeah. But at, at usanpn.org, um, we actually have a new map on our website, which we were really excited about this because we wanted more opportunities for our local phenology programs to be able to like share their programs or share their data or access their data or like teach people about what they're doing and also make it easier for volunteers who want to look at, you know, phenology and want to get started or who want to get involved, how they can do that. Um, but we have this map now of all the local phenology programs that we have throughout the United States. Um, you can even filter it. Um, so look, I picked up the Linda flooring. Um, and there you are. But people can, um, but if anyone wants to get involved, you can check out that map. You can check out the different programs um, and be able to reach out to see how you would like to get involved. Um, with that, we have a few more minutes. Um, open it up. If anyone else has any questions that you want me to ask, if you want to type it into the chat, I can ask them. Um, otherwise, um, if anyone just has any closing things that they want to say, but I wasn't expecting anything like that, I just really appreciate you guys coming and sharing with us and um, the heart and soul, right? It's funny, right? Because you're collecting data and you look at graphs and you look at Excel sheets. And the reason that those graphs and data and Excel sheets and why you have millions and millions of records of seasonal changes all across the country is because of these individuals and because of these groups um, who are just so passionate and engaged um, and love the work that they do. So just thank you all so much for everything. Um, it means so much. I kind of made it closing then. <laughs> Yeah, thank and it's five minutes. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean for it about that. I just felt sentimental. Um, but just thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can see you at monthly calls. And if not, no worries. It's not like a stressful thing. But we we love seeing you guys and hearing from you guys. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy your spring and your summer. And yeah, enjoy watching nature. Thank you all. <laughs>